Very good. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever your time zone happens to be. Uh, and welcome to the inaugural Hydrology Section Early Career Award webinar. I'm Scott Tyler. I'm the president of the Hydrology Section of AGU, and it's my pleasure to start today's webinar. The section's early career awards are given to three, up to three young scientists in the section. And young here is early career is, is 10 years or less since their PhD. Successful nominees are scientists who demonstrate outstanding contributions to the hydrologic sciences, education, or scientific or societal impacts, and also show in, uh, exceptional promise for continued co con contributions to hydrology throughout their career. This year, we have three amazing researchers who are going to be sharing stories with you over the next three Fridays. So this is the first. We'll be having two more of the following Fridays, the 13th and the 20th. Our three awardees this year for 2020 are Veronica Morales, Simone Fatiki, and Nico Wanders. Just a few logistics for the webinar series today. We are recording the webinar, uh, and it will be available hopefully early next week. If for some reason we have a technical issue um, here in the West Coast, we're having quite a bit of wind, so it's possible we might lose power. And if uh, we drop off, uh, we will try to get everything back running up, up to speed. If we don't, we will record the webinar um, offline and we'll make it available to all of you. For questions, you should have a question box over on the right-hand side. Type your, uh, your questions into that box. Um, if you prefer not to have your name read uh, off, because I will try to, to say who the questions are from as we go through, um, just put a note in the question and I will try to uh, follow that. And we'll read as many questions as we have time for this morning or this afternoon. Uh, finally, last logistics for the, for the setup. Uh, the bathrooms are down the hall and to your left or right, wherever you happen to be. So be safe and thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Holly Aldroyd from the University of California, Davis, and she will introduce our first awardee lecture, Dr. Veronica Morales. Holly? Thanks, Scott. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Heather Bischel and Dr. Tom Thomas Hardier for helping with uh, this nomination uh, for Veronica. Um, it's truly an honor to be able to speak to Dr. Veronica Morales's numerous contributions to hydrologic sciences. And I think it's really a shame that we can't celebrate her many successes in person. So please remember to seek Veronica out and shake her hand at AGU 2021, um, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, Dr. Veronica Morales has made outstanding contributions to, the, to understanding the hydrophysico-chemical processes responsible for contaminant transport in Earth's subsurface pores and water. This work is critical because contamination represents one of the greatest pressures on the sustainability of groundwater worldwide. And her novel approaches are transforming our understanding of how to tackle this urgent water resources challenge. Broadly speaking, her research investigates fundamental pore scale processes and the subsequent transport at the landscape scale. For example, at the smaller scales, her notable works include publications on multi-phase systems, engineered nanomaterials exposed to varying pore water chemistry, pathogenic biocolloids in agricultural settings, um, other colloids such as those from hydraulic fracturing or from intense fires, and filtration by flow-induced aggregation. To bridge the huge range of physical scales inherent to these systems, she uses state-of-the-art measurements to characterize both flow velocity and underlying microstructure of the porous medium to, drink, to, to link not drink, to link transport processes to structural features that control them. She uses the, the results from her fundamental pore scale processes to develop new parameterizations that combined with stochastic modeling can upscale effective transport to the field scale. This work offers significant improvements, especially in, cap in capturing anomalous transport behaviors um, that are ubiquitous in real hydrologic systems um, and which conventional models fail to properly describe. Finally, Dr. Morales is committed to, to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university and through her public out, outreach activities. She is a highly engaged and proactive mentor who stresses scientific rigor, but also service, as she and her research group combine um, team building and outreach activities, which is really cool. Clearly, Dr. Veronica, Veronica Morales has established herself as a rising star in our field and this award is a greatly deserved distinction. So please join me in congratulating Dr. Veronica Morales for er earning the AGU 2021 
2020 Hydrologic Sciences Early Career Award. So I'll pass the web over to Veronica. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you, Holly, for the incredibly kind introduction. And Holly, Heather, and Thomas, thank you so much for the nomination. And to all my letter writers, I'm incredibly appreciative. Um, it is a huge honor to receive this award, and I am incredibly happy to share it with two other excellent, excellent scientists, Nico and Simona. Um, my work is, is really, really fundamental, so um, I generally try to keep in mind ways in which it can be used to address practical problems. Um, so the recognition from the hydrologic section for the work that I've done um, in my 15 years of doing research really means a lot. Um, <clears throat> So good morning, good day, good evening, good night um, to the people in the audience, wherever it is that you might be. Um, and I wanna thank you for taking time to learn a little bit more about what I do. Um, for, those who do for those who don't know me personally, um, I wanna share a little bit about where my scientific curiosity for, for subsurface systems began. Um, and this really started in, 20, in 2004 with a challenge. And the challenge was to correctly put together a puzzle in the dark, whose pieces were very difficult to gauge with precision. And so with the work that I'm summarizing this morning, um, I'd like to give you a bit of an idea of how I've managed to cast light on several subsurface puzzles in both literal and figurative ways. Okay, before I jump in, I want to thank my colleagues, my mentors, friends, and importantly, the students who've made a lot of the work uh, possible. So specifically, I wanna thank Zoe Canavas, um, uh, Maxence Carell, and Fabian Arns for inspiring me and allowing me in turn to inspire them to regularly search for answers to really hard questions and to be gritty in doing so. Um, I also wanna acknowledge my funding sources for supporting me to travel kind of everywhere in the world. Okay, so I find, um, Processes for flow and transport in porosmia to be absolutely fascinating. Um, in the critical zone, the important porous media um, that are of concern are of course soils and rocks, and the processes generally occur in um, the liquid that's in these uh, in this matrix, so water. To give every uh, to make sure that everybody's caught up, um, I just want to explain that the phenomena for flow really relates to the speed and direction of the moving groundwater while well, transport relates to the stuff that is in this water. And generally the, start, the stuff that we're concerned with are contaminants. Um, and these arise from a variety of activities, um, most notably from agricultural, industrial, and urban in nature. And generally as a society, we agree on a certain set of goals to manage this incredibly important natural resource. And these include um, sustainable groundwater use, ways in which we can prevent further pollution of existing resources, and importantly, strategies that would allow us to be more successful at remediation or remediating already contaminated sites. And the thing is that achieving these goals from an engineering perspective really hinges on two important aspects. The first one being that we have a thorough understanding of the processes that are involved in flow and transport phenomena, and the second one being that there are available and accurate models that allow us to make predictions about how this stuff is going to move um, underground. And generally speaking, what we um, use and what we teach at the university is that contamination in the subsurface moves um, as, as a Gaussian plume. And so if we assume, for instance, in this cartoon uh, schematic, that there's been a spill of some blue dye in the subsurface, um, we expect that this plume, um, and I'm here illustrating a plume map with blue contours, we expect that this stuff is going to begin moving in the direction of flow. And it's gonna be moving in the direction of flow with an average velocity that is dictated by the groundwater speed. And it's going to begin spreading in all directions as predicted by Fick's law. Um, it acquires eventually an oval shape um, that is still Gaussian. Now modeling the concentration using conventional methods at uh, the well that is located here by the red X would give us, um, and, and based on the understanding that it, stuff moves in this Gaussian shape, 
would give us um, a concentration history that looks a little bit like this. So it's Gaussian or nearly Gaussian in time as well. Um, as the concentration passes through this particular point in time, it rises fairly quickly and it drops back down to zero pretty quickly. And the spreading of this would be fairly predictable. Now, this is what we generally consider to be normal transport. Um, but the irony is that these features are rarely observed in nature or even in the lab in extremely controlled environments. <clears throat> so most plumes are not oval shape. Um, they are in fact pretty amorphous um, as illustrated here by the plume map of a contaminant of a, at a Superfund site in California. So on the left, I'm showing uh, so the left and the right are plume maps of the same thing. The left just happens to be the map at uh, the beginning, and the map on the right is the map after 17 years of pump and treat remediation. Um, the color, again, is supposed to be indicative of the concentration, um, um, the level of contamination. And just by looking at the map, one might conclude that the remediation strategy was not actually very successful. So what we know um, about what's going on is that during migration, contaminants advance um, in regions of the main flow, and this causes um, an early breakthrough of that concentration at a given well. That is illustrated here by the deep blue. Simultaneously, we know that con uh, contaminants are migrating into regions that are stagnant um, in terms of flow, and that is here illustrated by the light blue. That stuff then very slowly gets released back into the main paths of flow, and this leads to uh, fairly low yet significant concentrations of material X. In this case, we're talking about trichloroethylene, and this occurs over extended periods of time. Now, the combination of this early breakthrough and the late tailing of very low concentrations gets manifested in ubiquitous, very skewed concentration signals of even tracer, um, conservative tracers in groundwater systems. And we've seen this in a variety of settings, um, not limited to sand columns in the lab, um, field experiments in extremely heterogeneous systems, um, extractions of natural cores like Berea sandstone, and even in um, porous media that are being colonized by biofilm forming bacteria. And the takeaway from this is that um, it is likely that the, this heavy tailing and um, a lack of recognition that this is ubiquitous might be the primary reason why we uh, are not necessarily meeting very well the goals uh, expected to restore and remediate uh, groundwater systems. And in fact, these trends are consistent in a variety of settings that we study them, and also in the scales at which we might be investigating them. So this is seen over and over again when we study um, uh, porous media systems at the pore scale, when we extract cores from the field, as well as when we study them at the field scale. Every single scale um, demonstrates that there is, if, if using um, the appropriate methods and you wait long enough to measure that concentration signal for prolonged times, so you will see that there is this heavy tailing that is persistent. And it suggests that this is a multi-scale problem that we need to address. Now, there's a growing recognition that volume averaging models are, in fact, the most efficient at capturing that long tail in concentration and therefore they fail to predict this anomalous transport behavior where anomalous transport really literally refers to um, concentration signals that are not Gaussian um, in, in space and in, in time in addition. And there's a need, of course, for better models or adjustments to existing models that can capture these salient features that are pretty well observed um, in, in the field. And there's a variety of advanced models out there um, which have not been as broadly accepted as volume averaging approaches that in fact are showing a lot of promise in addressing this need. And I'm, I, I'm going to personally talk about my personal favorite um, that I use in my research today. And so to try to get at this, um, at this need in our scientific field, um, my work has been focused in the last several years to um, build physically based models that use a probabilistic approach that describes and captures these features that are unique to anomalous transport. And so since I've been um, at UC Davis, I've assembled a team of amazing students um, 
who attempt to do this by combining experimental, numerical, and theoretical tools to study flow and transport processes in heterogeneous uh, porous media, st structurally heterogeneous porous media. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking today about um, just two uh, exciting topics that we've been studying recently. And the first one will start um, with a question of how velocity evolves in space and time, but from the perspective of a contaminant particle. So what I'm gonna be doing is presenting some empirical data in the models that we use to describe this behavior. Um, the empirical data that I'm, um, that I'm gonna be using um, is illustrated in, in this diagram. And uh, we gather this as a set of trajectory, uh, trajectory particles um, that were tracked in a transparent porous medium. So it gives you the first hint of how I'm casting light on um, some of these processes, quite literally. Um, so by following these individual tracers as, as they're sampling different regions of a porous medium and a developed flow field, um, it allows us to measure the local Lagrangian velocity of a discretized plume um, with a physical means. Um, the particle trajectories that I'm showing here are color-coded by their instantaneous velocity, and you can imagine that this gives us a wealth of information that pretty much tells us anything that we might care to know about um, the plume behavior. Um, and so analysis of velocity as a process that is changing both in time and space is what we are focusing on for this particular um, area of study. <clears throat> Now, the first thing to acknowledge is that um, we know that as particles begin to move through a porous medium, it's impossible for them to sample the full velocity variability immediately. So the first thing we wanted to learn was how velocity statistics change in time. So on the what I'm showing here is a moments analysis. Um, on the left, um, you'll see the av how the average velocity evolves in time. Um, this is the so-called mean displacement, and what it tells us is where the center of the plume will be um, as it's traveling through the porous medium. Um, so as, as the plume gets going, we'll be able to, with, with this analysis, figure out where the center of it would be. What we see is that the relationship in, between the mean displacement in time scales linearly, and this is indicative that velocity is effectively constant in time for this particular uh, porous media system. On the right, on the other hand, what I'm showing is how velocity variance is changing in time. And what this tells us is how quickly this plume is spreading um, in space. And this spreading, um, as you can see here, is not following that one-to-one -one line in this uh, log-log scale. In fact, um, the slope indicates that we are scaling at a rate that is much faster than, than time is, is evolving. And the, even though it seems to be slowing down, right, at the beginning it has a slope of two, towards the end it has a slope of one and a half, um, it's still scaling much faster than the rate um, that is predicted by Fick's law. And so it indicates that spreading is, is fairly quickly, it's slowing down, but at all times it is faster than what we would expect from Fick's law, and therefore conventional models, um, based on generally the advective dispersive equation, will be insufficient to capture the behavior of, these, of, of the plume observed here. And so the rate of spreading, this faster than Fickian rate of spreading is the hallmark of anomalous transport. And so the next thing to do is to try to conceptualize, okay, so we're spreading faster than transport, what does that mean in terms of the compartmentalization of particles moving in the system. And so if you recall, I um, discussed um, earlier that particles essentially are so somewhat partitioned into regions of preferential flow in stagnant zones. And so we need to understand the residence time um, that particles are spending in each of these two regions and how long, in fact, it takes to transition in between them. Um, what we do is quantify this relationship with um, the spatial correlation of velocity, as well as the probability distribution of the velocities that are even available to be sampled. So drawing your attention to the figure on the left, um, what it's showing is the autocorrelation of the velocity along the path of individual trajectories. Um, this analysis tells us that as particles move in a porous medium, their instantaneous velocity um, 
when it jumps to a, a discretized um, space a little bit further away, will be somewhat similar to the velocity that it had in the immediate prior position. And so you can think of this as a very short-term memory um, in velocity, and this follows essentially, or, or it suggests that we're dealing with a Markovian process. Um, the velocity, in fact, that these particles are going to remember um, somewhat as they become um, transported in a porous media is being sampled from a log normal distribution, which is the, the figure that I'm showing here on the right. Um, and although uh, there are a broad variety of um, velocities that particles can sample as they're moving along, um, there are, in fact, rules at the sequence in which they will be sampled. So these are not independent samplings from, from this log normal distribution. And so we must establish first some rules about how they're going to be sampled. And so the idea was to come up with, for this study, was to come up with a mathematical description that tells us how velocity is changing as a particle is moving through, um, through its space, through the pore space. And fortunately for us, we, we um, identified, um, with the help of Marco Dentz, um, a mathematical expression that actually captures some of the features that we measured about the velocity process. Namely, that we are sampling from a log normal distribution, um, but we also know that these velocities are not sampled independently. There is a spatial correlation that needs to be um, considered, and it's this Markovian process or the short-term memory that uh, must be accounted for. So we used an established Markovian process, an Einstein Lindbeck process, in fact, to describe the velocity evolution. And so the expression here is showing us that the change in velocity, which is given by a log normal um, distribution, changes along the trajectory length in S, given by the velocity itself, um, a sampling of this log normal distribution of velocities that are described by parameters, um, the mean and the variance parameters uh, given here in green. And in addition to that, we impose a white noise that is representative of Brownian motion given here by this eta n term. Um, to put this together into a model, um, what we effectively do is break up uh, our simulated plume into an enormous amount of discrete particles that each have a unique trajectory that we're gonna build according to equations of motion that are dictated by the statistics that we just measured. So my favorite approach, and which I learned as a postdoc at ETH, um, relies on continuous time uh, random walk theory. So the idea here is to build simulations that are based on the Euler scheme, um, where every step of a simulated trajectory is essentially sampling a new velocity that follows the rules that are assigned by the Markovian process. So integrating the velocity here um, in W tells us that as we are moving a particle, one, um, one space increment given by delta S that is consistent in space, the waiting time between these jumps is dictated by the velocity that is sampled. And so we have a new velocity that is related to the previous velocity, and that velocity tells us the waiting time that it takes to jump that uh, increment of delta S in space for every, for every trajectory that is moving along. So velocities are sampled anew, they're somewhat related to their uh, immediate position in the past, and this gives us the waiting time um, that it takes to travel that small delta S in space. Okay, so to, demonst to demonstrate the performance of our approach, I'm presenting here the data, again in cyan, and uh, the model simulations in black, to show that this is in fact a, a really excellent approach for um, describing anomalous transport. So on the left most uh, uh, figure, what I'm showing is that we correctly reproduce the distribution of velocities in our virtual perm. We're, you know, not doing amazingly well at capturing the very slow velocities, but even though there is this defici deficiency, we still can capture the average location of the plume and its rate of spreading really well, and that is illustrated in the figure in the middle. Um, so we, we capture correctly this evolution or rate of spreading uh, in time, and the transitions that it follows when it goes from extremely fast, the ballistic regime, to a super diffusive regime, and can make, uh, extend the predictions to predict how, how quickly it'll resume to acquire this uh, Bakian behavior. <clears throat> 
Now, because this is a Lagrangian model, we're also able to reproduce um, the intermittency of particle dynamics in a porous medium. And for those of you who don't know what intermittency, intermittency really just describes that there are long periods of low velocity that are interrupted by short bursts of high velocity. And the distribution of these jumps is effectively what is being illustrated here from the data as well as the simulations. And really the point is to, to show you that this Lagrangian approach in fact even reproduces this intermittent behavior at the pore scale correctly. And what I want to emphasize is that this approach is really unique in its ability to capture statistics, um, that, uh, statistical rules of particle motion that were ascertained at the pore scale and uses it in a model that allows us to upscale the behavior of what we should see as far as transport phenomena goes at the macroscopic um, level. So we're able to take rules studied in a very small compartment of the subsurface and scale them up to make predictions about this anomalous <coughs> transport at much larger scales. And it seems to be working really well to describe the continuum of these um, of these two different sizes that which we measure, um, or we're interested in, in understanding uh, flow and transport. All right, so this kind of model is a lot, opening up a, a huge number of doors. Uh, um, it's allowing us to, of course, work with much more complex systems. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so some of the ones that we're, we're investigating now include, uh, for instance, bioclogging as a media that is not just heterogeneous in space, but in fact is also dynamically evolving in time. And that's been uh, an approach that seems to be working relatively well for that kind of system. Um, and more recently, we've also been using this to study reactive transport in the context of uh, colloidal filtration and try to do a better job at explaining these uh, anomalous deposition behavior for <laughs> particles that are being um, removed by a filter medium. All right. Um, so for the next um, theme that I want to talk about, I want to take a step back and say that the model uh, is really, really great when you have data to parameterize it. Now, if experimental methods are, in fact, not available to see through the porous medium, um, effectively, the only option left is to solve the flow in the porous medium and track particles moving through it. And this is an incredibly expensive computational endeavor. So what my students Fabian and Zoe thought would be really useful would be to extract features of flow organization based on information strictly about the pore structure. Um, we understand that the pore spaces collectively control the way that things are moving um, through it. And so we figured that we might be able to recast uh, flow resistance into a graph theory problem um, and use that to borrow mathematical tools that allow us to learn where, how, and why complex flows um, develop in the first place. <clears throat> So we created a rich data set of different granular packings um, in which we would know both structural information and the flow um, that uh, is developed in each sample and try to come up with, with graph theory um, with a way to be able to predict uh, flow from just the structural information. And so this has been ongoing through uh, two sets of master's thesis. And I think we've, we finally hit the nail on the head on, on this particular topic. So the very first thing that we needed to do was to establish a metric that allows us to quantify how channelized the flow is. Um, generally, we think of this qualitative way to assess that a system is preferential, is experiencing preferential flow or performs fairly uniform flow, but there's no set metric to distinguish the two um, or even a cutoff to say that something is preferential and something is fairly uniform. So we came up with a way to do this in a quantitative and objective way because we ended up finding out that through our vast um, data set that we have been working with that has a broad range of flow channelization distributions, um, when we pulled up two samples that had equivalent pore size distribution, in fact, we found starkly different developed flow. And therefore, we should expect that the transport in that system will be very different. So our metric for measuring or quantifying the degree of channelization is based on percolation theory. 
What this does is really just allows us to divide the flow into two compartments. The stagnant flow that is illustrated here um, on the thresholded um, image on the right is uh, depicted in blue, and the primary flow region is the combination of white and pink areas. Um, in a nutshell, this thresholding approach allows us to normalize the velocity field in a, as a continuous region of high velocity channels that connects inlet to outlet. So the first establishment of this continuous region tells us the um, departure from the average velocity that, um, that segments the flow field into regions of high velocity and low velocity. So this classification is the very first step to infer the contrast that is expected in these two compartments of how things move. Um, and this is purely based on structural features. So to illustrate the point, I'm directing your attention to the, to the uh, PDF on the bottom right. Um, and this is showing the velocities in the primary and the stagnant regions for the two samples that I'm um, illustrating above. So uniform flow is uh, it's shown in blue. And it shows that the difference of expected velocities in the primary versus the stagnant region is actually not so different. When we're looking at a sample that is truly classified as preferential flow or channelized flow, um, we see um, the, the red curves that the distributions are in fact very different. And even though this is not surprising, um, it's an explicit definition of the velocities to be expected and a way to quantify how channelized that flow is. Because of course it is on a spectrum. It's not it's not a binary cutoff to say something falls within the uniform or the preferential flow um, category. All right. So considering that the entire wealth of information about the structure of our porous medium is contained within its pore network, um, what we needed to do next was to extract the equivalent graph um, here shown in white as a skeleton of the pore space and assign weights to its edges that are related to some geometrical property um, of those channels. Um, so Zoe um, thought that we might be able to predict the path of primary flow based on a biased shortest path analysis of our poor network. And the question of course was, what bias are we going to assign to this graph to make sure that we can match the shortest path based on structural information to the primary flow path that we got from direct numerical simulations. So she spent a good chunk of this year building an evolutionary algorithm that would allow to test the different possible permutations of these geometrical characteristics to bias the shortest path analysis that would be generalizable for the broad range of degrees of flow channelization that we have in our data set. And so um, she measured the goodness of it um, of, our, um, of our trials by mapping really the experimental uh, information with a graph and looking for agreement in that pathway. Once we had agreement, we assumed that that uh, represented high um, accuracy, but also we penalized models that were over parameterized to choose uh, a simpler yet well-performing system. And we were wondering, okay, so we're doing a pretty decent job at choosing one way to bias systems that have broad degrees of preferential flow and so we wanted to run a control to get gauge, uh, to get a sense of how accurate our system was. And so what I'm showing on the left now is the cumulative, um, complementary cumulative distribution function of the accuracy. So the, the ability to actually predict that pathway in our system. And um, we have our approach of our weighted uh, bias in orange and a control given here in blue, where the control is really no weights assigned, we're just counting the number of steps to go from inlet to outlet. And in fact, what we see is that our approach performs very, very well in being able to predict preferential flow paths in structures of arbitrary um, degree of channelization. And so we feel that this answers the question of where um, primary flow occurs and how to describe it based on structural information really well. Now, the last question that we aim to answer with this work was the why, right? Why are these paths forming where they are forming? And we suspected that this might be tightly linked to the network's level of organization. So we went ahead and divided our entire poor network and split it into two subnetworks. The first one corresponding to the primary flow region, illustrated here in pink, um, and the second one pertaining the um, stagnant flow, shown here in blue. So separating these two subnetworks, what we then went ahead was to measure the level of order in, within these um, systems. And the order uh, metric that we chose essentially 
measures the preference of a network's edges to attach to others that are similar to themselves in some way. Um, a property that we suspected might be uh, shared or the similarity across these, these edges would be based on the bias that we use for the shortest path analysis. And so if we measure similarity according to that bias for the abstracted networks, um, what we found is that yes, actually, core networks um, that are corresponding or the subnetworks that are corresponding to the uh, primary flow are very highly ordered. And the stagnant regions are just a complete mess. They are very disordered. <clears throat> and this is evident in the scatter plot that I'm showing below, um, where each data point uh, corresponds to one sample and the level of order that they have in the primary flow subnetwork, as well as the primary, uh, the segment flow subnetwork. And what we see is that all the data points fall below the one-to-one -one reference line given here in black. Um, surprisingly, the other thing that we see is that there's a huge contrast between this level of organization and the samples that indicates how channelized the flow is. And that is illustrated here by um, the red. So the more channelized the flow is, the stronger the contrast is between order in these two subregions of the porous media. And this is really exciting in terms of um, our ability to infer dynamic properties uh, about the flow from static properties of the porous structure. And so we're excited to continue exploring this, um, this system further and try to infer the exact velocities that should be predicted um, from, from these network um, systems that are independent of um, direct numerical simulations to save us a, a significant amount of computational effort. And so I just want to summarize now some key points that I would like you to, to take away from this talk, um, and specifically about features that are salient in, in subsurface transport, where the first one is that early arrival and the late tailing of very low but significant concentrations are in fact the norm in subsurface transport. And as Diego Bolster has suggested at one point, we may need to change the name for anomalous behavior to normal because we do see that um, in, in most cases. The second point is that um, the sequence in which velocities are sampled um, in a porous medium controls how a plume will be spreading and eventually how it mixes with other things that are in, in the system as well. And defining the rules at the pore scale um, in a way that successfully describes microscopic behavior is really a victory for upscaling models. The last bit is that the level of order of the pore microstructure, um, we've demonstrated that it can be used to extract key features of the flow topology. So it allows us now to move into more efficient ways to infer flow and transport from tools that are a little bit easier to acquire based on structure. And so with that, um, I would like to invite you to our group's web website and even to Davis when it's safe again to do that, um, to find out more about what we do. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Veronica. This is Scott in the background. Um, I'm not Hi, showing any, please type your questions into the question box. Mine are not showing much yet, so please do so. Um, and feel free to do that during the lecture as we're going along, uh, or as we were going along. Um, I, Veronica, I, I have a question kind of related to, to sort of my old life as, a, as an engineer, as a young engineer, which was working on, on water filtration, uh, slow sand or rapid sand filtration plants for water treatment. Uh, yeah. which always worked really well, right? I mean, the, the, they, they filtered extremely well, and yet they were a, obviously a, a fairly uh, uniform porous media, but still had all kinds of flow channels and things like this that often happen during backwash and, and other sure. things. And so could you relate sort of the success of that to, the, to some of your work early on, which was looking at correlation length scales and velocities? Is it I guess my question is, why do they work so well, even though they're disordered? Is it simply over design? Um, sorry, I, 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 I didn't quite understand the question, so it's okay. I'm sorry, I was rambling a bit, but it's it the the filtration systems actually work very very well and mm -hmm. um, a very efficient particle um, removal. And yeah. I'm wondering, right. have they simply gotten past the heterogeneity issue? by over-designing, and these are often designed, you know, um, uh, trial and error, uh, 
is mm -hmm. it simply an incredible over design of the length of the filter path of the filter bed pathway so that any fast pathways or heterogeneity is essentially uh, right it, it then be, behaves gaussian i guess my question right and so 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 my question would be um whether the methods that you're using to determine that your concentration has in fact gone down whether that is being looked at uh as as log units of reduction um mm -hmm. for for systems that are even made out of sand that we use in the lab if we have instrumentation that allows us to measure extremely low concentrations we see that there is this very low but persistent detachment is generally how we model it in in filtration theory um, of particles that are being eluded so um, i would be curious to know if the shape of the gaussian that you're referring to has been in fact looked at in um, in log scale because this ends up being frequently the telltale sign that in fact we're ignoring that little tail because we see that the bulk concentration has come out and the the tailing is pretty darn close to zero but if you look at it in a different set of eyes um you can and and you have the resolution and the sensitivity of analytical methods to measure that concentration you'll still see that heavy tailing persisting um so that's not to say that filtration systems are always inefficient um but generally we we do a, a pretty bad job as experimentalists myself included in making sure that we're focusing on that tailing because we get really excited that the bulk of the pulse that we injected already came out and so we kind of dismiss that but it becomes extremely important especially when you're dealing with substances that are very low concentration and extremely toxic like for instance with viruses excellent thank you i appreciate it yes i i suspect these days probably it is being done but not when i was there years and years ago. And we have a few questions. A uh, question from Ahmad Jang. Um, mm -hmm. If you understood correctly, you mentioned spreading is stronger or faster than the transport, but at the pore scale. Can you comment on this? And will it be true for large scales, for example, the reach mm -hmm. scale or the watershed scale? Sure. So, so generally speaking, we see that the spreading happens um, not just within um, the very simple system that I was showing, that is an experimental, it's a little cube that is four by four by four centimeters, um, but uh, this allows us to measure the dynamics at the pore scale, right? So at this tiny scale for a, for a very uniform medium, we already see that we have enhanced spreading. Um, at the field scale, we see the same behavior. Um, even at the Borden site in Canada, there is this enhanced spreading that um, is difficult to account for and this is about as uniform as it gets in in a field site that is being studied now for instance when you look at the data from the made site from mississippi which is structurally very heterogeneous the spreading becomes even more intense so we see this enhanced spreading behavior no matter at what scale we study it um, but what we our intention was to um, develop or understand the process of how velocity is changing within pore spaces because we understand that um, there's going to be an accumulation of billions of pores that are being traversed as the plume particles are moving through the system that cumulatively give you that behavior of spreading and so um, at early times i was showing that the spreading is very fast so this is the so-called ballistic regime in which essentially you're moving in a tube that hasn't um, changed velocity. So you can almost think of it as, as moving through a capillary tube where the velocity is the same. As soon as uh, a particle transitions out of this first pore, it samples a new velocity. And so that's where you have that um, super diffusive behavior that scales roughly in our sandstone-like media at, at a slope of 1.5. Uh, it takes, for these samples, it even takes quite a bit of time for it to resume that Fickian behavior um, where the slope or the, the variance grows with time linearly. And so um, in many systems, in fact, you can't reach that asymptotic behavior because there are structural heterogeneities ba that basically set back your clock of eventually slowing down to sample the full range of velocity variability in your system and you encounter a new strata. So it's, it's very persistent in lab settings, in field scales. So, um, yeah, it's ubiquitous. Okay, thank you. Um, question from John Wilson, uh, a tough question, as typical from John. Thank you. Great talk. 
Um, how will you upscale your new insights to the processes at the field scale, such as the trichloroethylene plume you showed early in your talk? So that the trichloroethylene plume is is a little bit trickier because we're dealing with a multi-phase system there with dense non-aqueous phase liquids. Um, and so scaling up to dealing with that particular system is not as straightforward as applying the methods that we already used. So I'm not entirely sure to answer that question. Um, but the idea is that the migration would follow this broad distribution of velocities. So if we perhaps are not, um, if, if we begin incorporating to, into the continuous time random walk model, this exchange of, um, or, or the, the dissolution of the ganglias of TCE back into the mobile water, we might be able to account for this broad distribution of velocities that is causing the spreading and the stagnation in these, in these other regions. But it gets a little bit more complicated, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you, it is complex. Uh, another question from uh, Dave Benson. Thanks, Veronica. Having worked in industry and academia, I have to ask, or Dave has to ask, do you see a path that can eventually link these theories to easily use tools that can be applied at field scales? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I hope so. Um, how we would do that is, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly this would be ideal, right? To be able to take all this fundamental work and apply it to something that is more practical and accessible to, to industry and, well, governmental agencies as well. Um, doing so is not trivial, and I think there's still a couple of extra steps that we need to work out, primarily dealing with representative elementary volumes that we're using to define these rules of motion. Um, but I think once we, we figure out that link, we might have a chance of, of actually making these, these models available to, to a broader audience. Thank you. Okay. Um, a question from Thomas Harder, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it a little because it's a bit long. Um, and, and Thomas works in, in uh, non-point source pollution where things like salinity and nitrate the concentrations are, are uh, uh, several orders of magnitude over background levels as opposed to the, the low concentrations at the heads and tails. So his question is how, and I just have to read down a little bit, there we go, um, how rel relevant do you think anomalous transport is to these kinds of uh, uh, contaminant, groundwater contaminant issues? Sure. Um, I think extremely relevant, right? So these, these models are not designed exclusively for slug injections. Um, they represent the dynamics of flow and transport for a continuous system. So it's fine for describing slow injections. Um, it's fine for describing uh, continuous injections. And the continuous injection is, in fact, what we were working with for, for understanding the velocity process. Um, so although we don't know, of course, where things started, because we are dealing with non-point source pollution, um, the flow dynamics and the rules of stochastic motion remain the same, regardless of whether you know or, or not um, where, this, where this plume is emanating from. Okay, I, I think he was also asking, and I'm just gonna take the liberty of, of, of adding on to his question. I think what he was asking too was, when we're dealing with, with contaminants that are well above background and, and, and well above contaminant levels that we need to worry about, Mm -hmm. is, is the anomalous transport as important as the mean transport? Well, I think it depends on the type of contaminant that you're concerned about. So mm -hmm. if it's something that has, you know, uh, an acceptable standard that is very low, then I would say, yes, it's absolutely critical to, to understand this anomalous transport because, well, I mean, it's very toxic to drink water if it's well above that, but it can be the, the make the difference um, in being able to go back and, and using water from a drinking well in the next, I don't know, 10 years versus the next 200 years if you get that tailing wrong um, and, the, and the threshold from EPA is, is set fairly low, um, generally at detection levels, right? That may not necessarily reflect the toxicity of of the contaminant that we might be interested in, but it at least tells you what you can measure um, to say if, if it's safe to, to drink or not. Okay, okay, thanks. 
and Thomas, feel free to add a question in the question box if I didn't get that correct. Um, this question comes from Mary Hill. Uh, it's her experience that practitioners are, are well aware that plumes generally violate Gaussian behavior. If your method can be supported by generally available data, I think you'll have a very grateful community. Uh, might you, sorry, might you comment on the data quantity and accuracy demands of the methods you've presented? Mm. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what what the data quantity uh, might be referring to, but um, as far as the quality goes, because these models are based on upscaling um, rules of particle motion from the pore scale, then to to describe what's happening at, at the macroscopic scale, then the quality needs to be fairly high. Um, in in our case, uh, for the the first part of the talk that I discussed, we we were running. Um, uh, experiments where we were able to sample with pretty high precision the exact velo the instantaneous velocity of tracer particles, and so we you would need to get information that is very highly resolved at let's say the the micron or the tens of millimeter scale. And so if if you're not able to get that information from experiments like we did in this extremely synthetic system. Um, then direct numerical simulations on the geometry of the pore space is pretty critical. And so that's another aspect that we're working on now um, that requires really high quality images of the pore structure and that is generally obtained with, uh, or most recently with X-ray computed tomography. And so the size, maybe the quantity of the data that, that you're asking about refers to the size of the sample that we're dealing with. And so to resolve properly the flow and therefore the transport to be expected in that system, you need a fairly small sample to gain high quality information with X-ray uh, computer tomography. And so there's a trade-off between resolution and size of the sample. And we get into this, uh, this argument about representative elementary volumes, but provided that the field um, has samples that are representative enough, I think it is possible to infer what is happening in that site based on representative and fairly small samples of the system that you can do direct numerical simulations on and parametrize the, the models that we're proposing. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like our last question, again, back from John Wilson. Your model mm -hmm. assumes steady flow. What happens if the velocity, magnitude, and direction are changing in time? Yeah. So when that happens, you got to start over. Um, there's there's really no shortcut about it. We are one aspect that we're trying to explore for a temporally evolving porous medium deals with these bioclocked systems. Um, but the time scale at which um, you know biofilm is growing tends to be a lot longer than the time scale at which things are moving through through the system, at least for the type of uh, bacteria that we are using. And so at that for, for, for that scale or that particular problem, um, we need to basically start over every time, but we're looking at how velocities are temporally evolving as the system becomes more and more bioclogged. Um, and although it it can be structurally dynamic, um, we're finding that there's essentially some some levels at which changes in the pore space sort of regulate each other. So um, for, for work that my student Jiawei Helen is doing in, in the lab, um, we're finding that there's essentially a level of bioclogging on which things more or less regulate each other. So there's not so much changes um, in terms of the expected velocity field that what might be ex uh, expected when the system becomes overly bioclogged. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, our last question is from John Nimo. What measurable properties of the medium, like grain size, consolidation, porosity, and other hydraulic properties, do you see as most useful for applying your methods in practice? Mm -hmm. so, so I suspect that John is referring to you know, the parameters that we're using to define these pedal transfer functions and to get an idea of uh, the expected velocity. Um, the problem with these, uh, with these pedal transfer functions is that you learn the permeability of the system and that tells you the average, right? Um, what we're arguing through our work is that the average is absolutely insufficient to tell you the broad variability of velocities that one would expect. And that is really the key 
of understanding how things are spreading faster than what we predict with conventional models. So rather than going to the conventional understanding of how flow is moving through a complex porous medium, what we are proposing is that um, looking at the structure and in fact how things are interconnected as a network of capillary tubes that have a particular order is really key. Um, exactly what needs to be measured, I mean, from at least the, the second project that I presented from, from Zoe and Fabian's uh, master's thesis, um, we're thinking that <clears throat> uh, parameters that describe essentially the tortuosity as well as the resistivity of flow in terms of the, the pore diameter, the pore throat diameter, are really key in, in allowing us to, to gauge how flow is being developed in an otherwise equal pore size distribution and equal grain size distribution systems. Okay, thank you. I think we're running up against the, the end of our of our time. Um, I just want to we think we will let's see pop my screen back on. I think we will we will close at this point. I just want to thank uh, first off, I want to thank the audio. Uh, I want to thank Veronica for a wonderful talk and great questions. So, um, as best we can, an applause from from our almost 100 uh, attendees for this session. So, I really appreciate all of you coming on. I do want to encourage for next week's uh, 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 webinar that those of you who are students and early career people start asking questions. Um, a lot of the questions were from some colleagues of my generation. We want to hear, we want to hear what you all think, young, the young folks of, uh, of, uh, uh, that are going to really going to make the difference, just as we heard from Veronica. So, Veronica, again, thank you very much for a wonderful talk and for a kickoff and being the, the guinea pig to start us off here on, on this virtual meeting platform that we'll be using for the next, uh, uh, the next almost two months now. Uh, as we roll into the fall meeting. So thank you very much and safe. And thank you also to Holly for a great introduction. Um, I just also want a couple other thanks uh, to Greg Bindner. Greg is with uh, the American Geophysical Union. He is in the background making sure that uh, that all of this works and it worked quite well, I think. So thank you very much. Um, please let me know uh, uh, any thoughts or suggestions, those of you who are in the audience, if you have, that it worked well and things we can improve on. And then I do want to remind you that next week, uh, the same time, same place, uh, but with a different login, will be our next early career awardee, Dr. Simone Fatiki, and he's going to be talking about frontiers in eco-hydrology. So um, the link is here. I will send that out. It will be on the hydrology section website as well, um, but you do have to register for a separate link. And then on the 20th of November will be uh, Nico Wanders. So. Um, I think we will wrap up at that point and thank you all. Stay safe, stay well, and we will see you again on Friday. Thank you all. Thank you again. <laughs>